You're listening to The Critical Thought, where we challenge our listeners to use critical thinking when examining the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. Hey, this is Lady C. In the upcoming episode, I have a very interesting guest, my friend, the grammar goddess. She has a lot going on. She is what I call the girl about town. She is the person that you want to know because she is very innovative, creative, and she's going to tell you all about her life experience and what it was like waking up to the truth about the truth. And she's going to give you a whole lot of information that could be very helpful to you. So I am welcoming to the platform, Daria Ross. Daria, welcome to the program. Hello, Lady C. Thank you so much for having me. Um, First of all, I want to thank you. Um, You and Mr. JT have been a tremendous and significant help to me in my um, waking up process. And I just appreciate all that you do. And I'm thankful to know you and call you my friend. Thank you so much. And the same, I'm, I, I look at you as a, a, a very strong individual. And, you know, after meeting you and getting to know you, and I was really happy because, like, I meet a lot of people online and get a chance to talk to them on the phone. But when you were in the D.C. area last year and mm-hmm. we were able to meet and break bread, that was so nice. Let's kind of start off just to let our audience know, you know, who you are and how you became involved with the group known as Jehovah's Witnesses? Sure. Well, um, my mom, when I was, I think, about four years old, she uh, started studying with a cousin um, because that cousin was babysitting me. And that cousin told my mom that she could she could watch me while my mother went to work, but she would have to take me in something called field service. And my mom asked her, well, what is field service? And it sort of went from there. And um, so that is is how it started. And so I was sort of, we celebrated Christmas until I was probably in the first or second grade. So probably about six or seven. So me and my oldest brother have minor memories of celebrating the holidays and Christmas. My younger brother and sister never celebrated growing up, right? I'm the oldest of four. Um, a tight, close-knit family. And so that's how all of that started. Um, I also think my parents were searching for a church home or family. You know, my mom had bad experiences from her church experiences growing up. So like a lot of couples, you know, one spouse supports the other in this endeavor um, and they, they do it, you know, for the sake of the marriage and everything. And I think that's what happened in the case of my parents. My dad's an elder now. Um, for many, many years now, um, and they're still um, active in it. And um, I have one sibling. My sister is still in the organization. So it's my parents and my sister and her husband and children. But me and my brothers, we are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Wow. I think it's amazing how the two words, field service, and I think she did that on purpose, didn't she? Because she knew that was going to make her think or ask questions and things like that. Uh, How long did it take before your mother took the bait or what did she do next? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? To really get her there. Right. Absolutely. hundred percent. I know that's what we, well, that's what they do. You know, they find a way um, to, as they would say, proselytize or, or minister to people. And so I believe in the case of my mother, that's what happened. And like I said, I think my mom, was a little bit vulnerable at the time because of some of her traumas, if you will, from her experiences with the church, the church. And um, I think that it was a sense of community and belonging. And I think that my mom liked that. Um, And so, yeah, my mother got baptized in 1977. So two years after 75. Interesting time for the witnesses. Yeah, it was. And, and my we, dad came in a couple of years later, like in 81. And again, like a lot of men, they, they support the wife. You know, they want to make their wives happy and they support the wife with it. And what I find most interesting about my parents, what I have observed, I think that in many respects, my father has sort of um, 
past my mom. He's he's very steadfast, if you will. He's very dedicated. He's very sincere about it. I think my mom is tired. You know, she's a woman of a certain age. You know, she's in her 70s. And I think she's tired. And I think that my mother would love to take a break or a pause. And she, I, I think both of them may have questions and doubts, but like a lot of people, they don't have the capacity or the strength or courage to say, hey, I've been doing something for over 40 years and it might have been a lapse in judgment or a mistake. I had my therapist, <laughs> we'll get into that, tell me, you know, Daria, you need to accept that they may never change because some people don't have the courage and or the capacity to deal with the fact that they made a 40 something year old mistake. They, they can't handle that. Mm -hmm. And I had to really sit with that. And once I looked at it that way, it was easier for me to accept that this is what they were doing. But again, that's a part of the hidden struggles, if you will, and the challenges when you wake up from something, you know? Yeah. Well, what was it like growing up in this religion for you? Well, that's a, that's a good question. You know, like a lot of young people, I struggled with the rules. Um, I remember in high school, I really wanted to participate in extra extracurricular activities, um, especially cheerleading and student government. You know, I, I, I really wanted to do that. Um, but of course I could not. I hated field service and I never wanted my um, school friends to see me walking down their streets, going door to door. And me and my older brother, we kind of laugh sometimes. We used to pretend <laughs> like we were ringing um, doorbells because, um, you know, we didn't want to, we didn't want our friends to see us. Um, I have one, one story that I thought about that I wanted to share um, that speaks to the traumas, the religious trauma that you get. Um, I was friends with a young lady. She was like a year or two older than me. So if I was 12 or 13, she might have been 14 or 15. And she had had sex. And she told me. And at the time in my mind, even though we were told, you know, if somebody does something, you're supposed to tell them or go to them and do it. I hadn't processed all of that yet. I mean, I was, like I said, 12 or 13. So it really hadn't registered with me yet. And I told another young lady. And she was one of what you would call the goody two shoes, straight lace girls. And she went and told her father. And she called me and she said, I told my dad what you told me. And you need to go and talk to that uh, young lady and her parents. So at 13, like I said, I was 12, 13, you know, we'll, we'll say 13. I had to tell my parents this. And then we had to, me and my dad had to go over to that young lady's home. And I had to tell on her and tell her father. And that situation stayed with me. And even talking about it now, I feel sad because um, I feel like the, the person that I'm talking about, We've stayed in distant contact on social media. And I feel like in a lot of ways, she just had a hard time after that, a hard time. And so, you know, I think that I was a good kid and I wasn't boy crazy. And I don't even know if this girl was, right? And it was just the things that impacted you. You know, I had crushes here and there, like every girl, normal stuff, normal growing pains that teenagers have. But because of the JW doctrine and culture, things were amplified and made much bigger of a deal than they ever should have been, you know? So. I totally agree because we, there was this brother that I worked with um, in the workforce mm -hmm. and he was probably 19 years old and I ran across some poems that he had written and he had written about maybe five or six of them. This is so embarrassing when yeah. you think about it. Yeah. And I had, you know, I had them in my possession and um, I bought them home and I showed JT <laughs> and he ended up calling his father who was an elder uh -huh. and let him know about these poems that didn't seem to be sitting right with this youngster that he shouldn't be writing like, you know, this kind of stuff. But it was like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And after I thought about it, I said, I said to JT, and I, and I just thought about this a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, do you think that that brother who was also an elder at the time, I said, do you think he thought we were crazy? And JT said, nope. He said he probably said something to his son about it or whether whatever it might have been embarrassing for him. Because looking back on it now, it really wasn't all that bad. This is what I'm saying. And and even, you know, that that situation, how many kids have been in situations like that? But it had to be this big thing, if you will, and the sit down and the the toll of being that age and having to say that to these people that I'm not even that connected to and just the, the, the whole dynamic. And I remember um, my parents were mad because I had told this other young lady, but I was just being a kid and like, you know, doing what kids do. And I remember my parents were like, you knew you were supposed to talk to us. And I was like, but I really did it, you know? And so it just speaks to, the the culture, mm -hmm. you know, if you will. I've got other experiences, but I thought about that one the other day. And again, to me, that's one of those hidden struggles, you know, because I, I felt bad about that for many, many years. And I even expressed that to the person that I'm, I'm I'm talking about when we were older. I told her, you know, in a note, you know, through socials, I said, you know, I often think about, you know, our childhood and I don't like how everything went and you're in my heart. And I've always thought about that because I felt like I needed to, to do that. But again, mm -hmm. this is what this organization does. And people on the outside <laughs> that don't know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, they have no clue, right? It's so it's, it's just so much pressure yes. that you you're under because it's like you're under a microscope. And like I said, just anything you do, if you say something, if you look the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, being at a movie theater and someone curses and you don't get up and leave and just oh all my kind God. of crazy stuff like that, you know. And that's why for me, I enjoyed not having young people that I grew up with that was in my school. Because not that I was doing anything wrong, right? But I didn't feel like I was under a microscope and yep. I could just and I never ate the birthday cake and I didn't do the Christmas or nothing like that just because nobody was there. But, you know, I could have regular friendships with people. Absolutely. It, it was less pressure on you. You know, mm -hmm. I was someone who, I think I've told you this before, you know, in, in conversation, I was never going to be a great Jehovah's Witness. I got baptized at 19, which by all accounts was late. And, you know, there were whispers. Why hasn't she dedicated herself and all of that? Um, and when I think about it, I did it to please my parents because I felt like that's what they wanted. And I felt like I had such a strong sense of community, you know? So I was like, okay, I got friends and da, 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 da. I can do this, you know, but many of the practices and the culture never, ever set well with me. I never followed the protocols when it came to disfellowshipping or shunning um, or disassociation. Um, one time I tried to, and I didn't speak to someone who was sort of on the peripheral edges of my family and were connected to my non JW family. And she, she mentioned it to them and they were like, you know, Daria's young, you know, she, she's confused. She's figuring it out. And I felt horrible that one time that I tried to do it. And so it was never, I, I just, I, 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 it never set well with me. And so Growing up in my 20s, I wouldn't say that I had doubts about the beliefs, but I didn't like the rules. And I just, I did, as, as it related to things like that, um, I just never wanted to comply with them. I was a good kid. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I didn't get in trouble. I, I never was in the back room, if you will, or anything like that. Back room, we can provide context, you know, when you have to meet with the elders about something that you've done or something like that. That was never me. I, I wanted to avoid that. I did not want to get in trouble, but I didn't like certain things. And I always loved the holidays. I always loved the holidays. And now as a middle-aged woman, I, you know, I do event design and decor. And I know that a lot of that is just my gifting and things that, that I have an affinity for. Is that because like growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, you knew you loved the holidays and you knew you loved probably doing the decorations, but you couldn't do it. And so now you're you've left 
And now you've got your calling back. Is that what you're kind of like? I believe I, I truly, truly believe that. And um, I always joke with my family. I'm like, look, when y'all come to my house, decorations are going to hit you in the head. They're going to be everywhere because that they will be everywhere because that is who I am. I, I love um, a theme. I love the festivities. I also like the family togetherness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the connections, which is why the other part of it and one of my deep personal struggles that I had a lot of anger about that I had to work through was the separation from family. You know, I was separated. I got a really big family. Um, I have cousins on both sides and the religion caused a huge disconnect at a certain point. You know, I was really close with my cousins as little kids, but then the longer we were in this religion the more separated we became. And then I think some of my other family members who are believers, they didn't want my parents and, and, and us as kids trying to indoctrinate their kids. So it caused a divide. So, you know, this is the first time I'm actually hearing someone say that their uh, non Jehovah's Witness family didn't want you indoctrinating their children. Yeah. So what was that all about? Were they trying to keep you off from, um, being in association with them or no they weren't trying to necessarily do that they wanted to be in association with us but they but they knew that jehovah's witnesses did not respect other people's beliefs okay they were fine respecting our beliefs but they knew that jehovah's witnesses and they'll deny it till the hills come home but they knew that jehovah's witnesses did not have boundaries when it came to that and so it caused a divide, if you will. And once I came into came to the realization that this was not serving me, I was mm -hmm. not happy. I was not going to continue to do this. And I can tell you exactly the moment that that happened. But once that happened, I was extremely, extremely intentional about rebuilding and fostering those relationships. And I, I am so thankful, you know, on my, on my mom's side and on my dad's side. I have very um, strong connections to my family. And, and the okay. fact that they were so, you know, I'm thankful that I have family that's so open arms and welcoming. And that's going to be the case for most people. They they want to be in relationship with us. And so they just waiting on us to be like, okay, I'm out. You know, in most cases, that's how it is, right? And so I, I really have worked hard through the years. Now, I haven't been a witness. I left in 2011 was the last time I attended a meeting and I had been sporadic, you know, before then, but right. I, I haven't been to a meeting since 2011. I've, I've, I had to go to a couple of funerals and I struggled with that, but I did it because I cared about the people involved. Right. Um, but you know, it's tw 2011 was so, so it's been a while for me. Right. Yeah. But I feel like I said, because I have close family that are in it, it's still right there. So like you said, you really didn't feel comfortable with all the meetings and all that when you were growing up. Did you ever do what they called like witnessing to classmates or to your non-Jehovah's Witness family? Did you ever try to witness? No. The only thing that happened to me, my grandmother, God bless her soul, she's deceased. She uh, passed away in 2021. Um, and I used to sit up and talk to her all the time. And I remember sitting at her kitchen table and being in my, you know, early 20s. And I was like, well, grandmother, what about the Trinity? And da, 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 da. And she looked at me and Kathy, this has stayed with me. She looked at me and she said, everything is not for me to know, Daria. And I don't have to have all the answers. And I never forgot that. And that's so different, right? The, the juxtaposition of that with how Jehovah's Witnesses got to have an answer for everything. If they don't have an answer, well, let me get back to you. You know, that's a return visit. Because I'm going to bring Brother Elder over and he's going to bring it back. There you go. And so he, mm -hmm. she told me that. But no, I did not witness to anybody because like I told you, I didn't like being outcast. I hated it. As a matter of fact, um, I fought tooth and nail to go to my prom and I had some aunties who were like, OK, we'll help you go. And they even told my, my dad, listen, if you don't want us helping Daria with this, we won't. He didn't say no, 
but he was like, I'm not involved. And I went to my prom. Now my brother didn't go and my youngest brother didn't go, but I helped my sister. She's six years younger than me. I was like, you're going to your prom. I'm going to help you. I'm, you're going to your prom and I'm going to make it happen. So I've always been, you know, I don't like injustice. I'm always the, you know, I fight, I root for the underdog. That's my personality. And so, um, to answer your question though, no, I was never someone that was trying to count time at school. I just wanted to have my friends get good grades and all of that. My parents let me participate in high school quiz bowl. I never made it to television with it because it used to be on television locally, but my brother and I, my older brother and I, I'm the oldest and he's three years younger than me. We're the two oldest of the four, but we were both on the high school quiz bowl team. So we were brainiac smart kids, right? Um, is that I, something that you did? Because I thought Jerry got on TV with that. He probably did. He, he probably talked about did. how when he got on there and his mother yeah. told him, you know, we're talking about Jerry Minor because we had yeah. interviewed him on Saturday and he was talking about how he made it on TV. Because remember, y'all from the same kind of right. we we're, right. we're, we're, we're from the same. We went to the same Kingdom Hall, different congregations. I don't even know if, if Jerry remembers me. In fact, we walked in a wedding together. He may not remember this is so long ago. <laughs> I can't even remember whose wedding it is, girl. But um, I know I did. I wasn't on TV, and my brother. I don't know if my brother was on TV. I'll have to ask him that. But we would. We were allowed to to be on high school quiz bowl. That was the only after school activity that we were able to do. I really struggled with that because, like I said, I wanted to be a cheerleader and I wanted to be in student government. Mm -hmm. Badly, you know. Um, so no, I was not witnessing to people. My friends knew that I was a Jehovah's Witness. They knew that there were things that I couldn't do. Um, in fact, one of my um, oldest friends from high school, we reconnected because of social media. And she said to me, I've always considered you one of my best friends. And we weren't, we didn't, you, you came to my house a few times and we went to the movies together once, maybe twice. But I knew that most of our time we were going to spend together was going to be at school. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how people are are uh, willing to still be your friend. I had a lot of people that I went to school with that were still nice to me and, yeah. you know, were willing to be my friend. But I had one girl one year. She was the only one that made a big deal out of me being a witness. And mm -hmm. I think that was probably the worst year of my being a Jehovah's Witness kid mm -hmm. because she would she would say, I don't like you. Because you don't celebrate Christmas, you know, or you, you know, she would just be, oh, she would be so nasty. And mm. she was actually uh, this one, this girl who um, she became friends with my best friend, mm. which she kind of made it. She kind of weakened our friendship because it's kind of hard being friends with somebody that's friends with somebody that don't like you. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, so I started gravitating to other people during that time because um, she was just making my life miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think a lot of hidden struggles, um, they sneak up on you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you, you might not even have an idea of, of why something affects you. You may have a memory like what you just talked about or um, a JW family member or friend is acting strange. You know, you don't, you don't know why. And then you might watch a YouTube video or see a topic in the XJW community. And then you go, oh, that's why that was happening. Or, you know, you, you, it, it just, it sneaks up on you in so many different ways. Right. You know, you also have like um, non JW family that were traumatized as a result of the religion and they don't even realize it. You know, mm -hmm. I um, do. I know that. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something else that was traumatizing for me was actual Jehovah's Witness family mm. that were being nasty. And um, they just weren't, you know, and, and I'm going to say it, it was my mom's uh, sister. Mm -hmm. She had two sisters that were witnesses and they were so mean. And, and I'm going to say the, this word nasty mm -hmm. because, you know, there's no reason for anybody to have to act like that, you know, but they were just judgmental. You could not do nothing for them, yeah. you know? And I think a lot of things that they were being nasty about was they thought they knew something about me that wasn't even true. Mm -hmm. And this guy, um, this one brother, 
had emailed me uh, through Facebook about three or four years ago. This is pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he goes, I thought you looked familiar on the internet. And he was like, oh, yeah. He goes, um, I used to hear your aunts talking about you all the time. And they said that you were a bad seed. And I was like, oh, really? I would like to know what that was all about. But, you know, um, I was not what they were saying. Well, you know what I think um, in a lot of instances, you know, and we've spoken about this before. There are a lot of women in the kingdom hall who um, they're actually oppressed because women have no agency. Mm -hmm. They have no, they're not revered. They, they can't hold a position. They can only, you know, go out and field service and sit on the sidelines. Um, and I think that they were bitter and angry and frustrated about that. So there was a lot of misplaced anger there. And I also think Kathy, excuse me, Lady C, a lot of times people You can they, say Kathy. They okay. <laughs> they they see a, a spirit or a vibrance there or a or a livelihood in you. Um and they don't like it. You know, I had that experience with an elder when I was married. We haven't gotten into that. But I was married at the time and this elder, he just did not like me. And I know that it is because I was a woman who was self-aware and I was not going to just sit there and, and be a subservient and keep my head down and cower down. I was confident. Mm -hmm. I, I was, um, you know, I, I, I was smart and I, I, and I, I took to pride in that. I wasn't haughty. I wasn't arrogant. I wasn't problematic. I was not a gossip. I was never in any, you know, drama, I didn't keep up mess, if you will. That's not who I am. I never, I wanted to avoid those things, in fact. But he could not stand me. And um, I had a situation. My ex-husband. He might have been, he might have been interested in you. And you know, someone you else. Know saying, you I'm just saying because when you were, when you, I remember when I was in the eighth grade, there was this guy in my class that just, he would always find a way to argue with me. Mm -hmm. And he was always pulling my pigtails. Well, come to find out later on, yeah, he had a crush on me. He had a crush on you. <laughs> right. Well, it's very possible, right? Um, this He was married with, with daughters, teenage daughters and everything. And my ex-husband and I, we didn't have children. We were um, the acronym DINKS, double income, no kids. That yep, was a, we were, that's what we were too. Mm -hmm. DINKS. And, Right. And I would auxiliary pioneer in the summer and things like that. But I was never quitting my job. I liked good shoes too much to do all of that. <laughs> so I wasn't doing that. But um, I think that sometimes, whether it is, you know, in your case, your aunts or whomever in your congregation, when they see you, sometimes you don't even see yourself. You don't even realize what you're projecting and, and, and the light that you are distributing. Right. And you were a light. You were positive. And your aunts just didn't like that. They did not like that. You know, well, you know what? Actually, I was just, you know, my mom let us go to parties. Mm -hmm. I, I, I She would let me go to the school dances and we go to cabarets and things like that. Nice. So I was I mean, I, and I wasn't getting in any trouble. Right. See, that one aunt of mine, they wouldn't let their kids go out. You know, mm -hmm. and so just doing regular, normal kid stuff. But, you know, you couldn't be good enough for these Jehovah's Witnesses. But I did live what I would consider a, nor a, a pretty normal life coming along. Yeah. Which made it nice for me because um, my mother trusted me yes. to do the right thing. And I, I didn't get into I didn't get into any trouble. And that's that's I think that's an important point. Um, your mom trusted you because so much of the culture of in, in the Jehovah's Witness community is one of snitching and tattling. And it really is a lack of trust, even though they try to present as if it's this worldwide unified brotherhood, if you will. But it's so far from that. Um, and, you know, one of my hidden struggles now, uh, I have a nine and a seven year old niece that are the loves of my life. And um, initially, when I was leaving, my sister didn't let me 
see my oldest niece and she went on to have another baby and I went on to get cancer. <laughs> and so the optics and life lives and things happen. And so there is a transition. So I have a relationship with them. Um, I'm, it's very delicate because, you know, at any moment she could be like, oh, no, you know. And so I have come to the realization that that could happen. The shoe could drop and she could decide, nope, you can't be around them. I have accepted that that could ha happen. I, I pray that it doesn't. And I do everything in my power to be a great auntie. But when I'm talking to them, you know, and they're they're nine and seven. And so there are these moments where the indoctrination just just surfaces. Right. And I know they're children, they're kids, so they can't help it. And so I think it's important to remember that, you know, um, I want to be a soft place for them to land when they get to be an adult and as they grow up and into those teenage years, because I know what it's like. I lived it. Right. Exactly. Um, and I, and, and I, I say things to them like, well, tell how was your meeting? You know, you went on a congregation camping trip. Tell me about it. I do it for a lot of reasons. Now, my sister is very vigilant and she's not going to be letting them spend the night and do things like that. I don't worry about that. She's very protective of them. But still, I'm that auntie. You know, I want to know what's going on, because if I get any inkling of anything questionable, I'll go Rambo. You know, I, I will I will well, tear a room down over them. I like the fact that you said that you like you want to be a landing place for them. Yes. Uh, you know, because a lot of people would probably be trying to unwitness to them. But you are showing respect to your sister by just being that support, you know, Absolutely. Because you can't really go into somebody's household and start telling their children, you know, to not listen to what's going on, because that's going to surely get her to stop letting you talk to them. Absolutely. You know? And, you know, and, and you're 100 percent. You are so right, Lady C. And I'll tell you something. What happens is life just happens and things happen naturally. Mm -hmm. And when you have kids who are smart and they start thinking and their their critical thinking skills are going to kick in. And my oldest niece, I, I see it happening already. And they know they can come to me and ask me anything they want. And I'm going to be honest with them, right? They, you know, do you think auntie is a bad person? No, you don't. Okay. Well, there's that, there's that critical thinking. Auntie's not bad, but she doesn't go to the kingdom hall anymore. You know, things like that. I'm going to let the way that I live lead. And I think that that's important for your, your viewers and listeners to understand. One of the best things that you can do, because we all have loved ones and friends that are near. I, these people are in my heart. Mm -hmm. I talk to you, my parents, my sister, my nieces. I have friends that are in this and I love them deep in the crevices of my heart. Yes, I want them out. But the way that you show them that you are OK and that you're good and that life is good on the other side is how you live your life and your choices. And so for me, you know, I got divorced. I divorced him, you know, and went through all of that drama and all of that and got out of it and was very intentional. I left Michigan and moved to the most expensive, toughest city in the world, New York City. But before you go that far with the story, mm -hmm. can you just kind of talk about how you and your husband met? Were you in the same congregation or no, you know? no, 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 no. Okay. So really quickly. Ugh. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So basically I was a single sister. I was from like, as you, as you, as we said, the Flint area, but I had gotten a job. I was a paralegal legal secretary, a paralegal, and I had gotten a job in the Metro Detroit area. So moving to the big city, if you will. And so I was in a congregation and there was a sister that was doing my hair. She was my hairstylist. And she told me, my husband has a friend and you need to meet him and you guys would be the perfect couple and da, 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 da. And so we met and I dated him and we, you know, I, in hindsight, if I'm being honest with myself, I never should have married him, but I was young and caught up in the JW culture 
of, of being married and having a, a wedding, if you will, and doing all of those things. Because what else do witnesses do, right? And so it was a situation like that. He had a, a, a good job. You know, he was gainfully employed. I was gainfully employed. He was, he came from a, a he was the youngest of 10 and he wow. came from this big family on um, the east side of Detroit and they were known. And so it, it was a, it was all what the young people say now, a flex, I guess, but he was corny and the whole thing was corny. Um, and I had a huge wedding. And again, to the point that I was always someone who, you know, uh, you know, pushed the envelope, if you will. I couldn't stand the recorded music at the Kingdom Hall. So when I got married, I hired a harpist and had a harpist come in and play the Kingdom melodies. That's right. your girl, Daria. So that's that's who I was. Right. Um, but didn't and we talk before about. You may have known people in my old congregation. Mm -hmm. I think, well, because I know where you're from and we ended up, we were in Detroit and then we ended up in the area where you were from. So there is some overlapping there, right? But one quick thing I have to tell you about, you're asking about the experience. In my second year of marriage, his sister physically attacked me at a witness uh, baby shower. Mm -hmm. What? One of his, I'm telling you, I got stories for days, but this one in particular, I will share um, because it, it it's really speaks to the, the culture, the JW culture. So my, my sister-in-law physically attacked me at um, my ex-husband, his niece's baby shower. And it was the silliest, pettiest thing. Um, she didn't like my relationship and my affinity um, and and my uh, regard for one of their adopted brother's children. Now, there were there were ten of them total. One was adopted, and I connected with that adopted brother's uh, sons. He had two sons and a daughter. Um, in fact, I'm still friends with with the daughter who is not a witness anymore herself, and we often laugh about this. Well, they were kids. They were teenagers, um, and I was like the young, cool aunt, right? And this, my ex-husband's oldest sister, she couldn't stand it. And so I was, we were at that baby shower and I was just talking to people and being a social butterfly and she bumped into me. And I looked at my sister-in-law, the wife of the adopted brother. And I said, so-and-so just bumped into me and she won't even say, excuse me. Girl, next thing I knew, that woman's hands was on my neck. Now, listen to this. She she choked me. And remember, I'm the outsider from up north in Detroit. So the, the woman, the sister that broke us up looked at me when she pulled us apart and said, think about Jehovah. She looked at me in front of this whole room. And I looked at her and I said, I am. Did you see what she just did? So my per my personality and the way that I am, and my family, some of them will laugh about this. I have some choice words for her. I, I cussed her. <laughs> and I got pulled. I know. No, you I didn't. Got, yes, I did. And I got pulled into a separate room. We were at this community center. So I'm high, I isolated in this community room and everything. And it's such a public thing. So the fallout from all of that was that when the circuit overseer came to visit, she was in a different congregation. When the circuit overseer came to visit, we were in a meeting. It was the circuit overseer, my elders, her elders, her, me, my ex-husband, and witnesses. Kathy, I was mortified. Because you think about it. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, these people think I've been fighting. I wasn't fighting. And, oh, my God, the, during the circuit overseer. And then there's the, oh, they're never going to appoint my, he was a ministerial servant. He's going to get deleted. Da, 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 all the craziness around that. And so the fallout was, um, I was, because it happened publicly, that the brothers, the elders told me that they had to publicly reprove me. But, and I couldn't comment for just two weeks. 
and my ex-husband had to be deleted. He would eventually be um, uh, reappointed. I, sometimes I forget the terminology. She was publicly reproved in her congregation. It was an embarrassment. And that, that's, that was back when we had the big conventions. And I remember that summer at the convention, it took me an hour to get out of the car because, you know, people talk. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to walk in the Silver Dome and every person that I am going to see is going to think about this situation and think I have been fighting. I, I mean, it was a struggle. And so that was one of my traumas. You know, and I, I think, about, you, you know, you think about that. That is religious trauma front and center. And so that that is another something that happened to me. You know, she eventually um, wrote me a note apologizing for it. But by then, I think that, that was probably one of the first um, cracks in, in the exterior for me and my ex-husband. I was never in love with my ex-husband. Like I said, I married, I got married for all the wrong reasons. So it, it, it wasn't going to take much to shake that. We never recovered because at that, after that, I remember he he took my side initially, right? And his mother, they lived out of state um, somewhere else. And she called him and slammed the phone in his face and told him, you need to control your wife. Ooh. And I think that that, you know, the fact that he had to deal with all of that from his family, I stopped going to any of the family functions. And like I said, they were a big, well-known family on the east side of Detroit, but I did not go to any more functions you know, I had people. I had my family and stuff. And so. This was his sister? This was his oldest sister. Wow. Yeah. Well, that was real traumatizing. It was. It was It was traumatizing. It was embarrassing. Um, you know, in hindsight, like we always say, is 2020 because I wish I would subject myself to any of that. You know, <laughs> I would have been like, I'm not meeting with anybody. Are you kidding me? She jumped on me. Get out of my face. You know, it would be you a know, totally... I'm, I'm just so surprised that they... Well, I guess I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but I guess because you're married and they're trying to say he didn't have his wife under control. So now he has to lose his position, his title. I mean, how you long did guys. you guys stay married after that? So we 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 got divorced. Um, I was married. I barely almost made the 10 year mark. So we probably separated into our eighth, mar eighth year of marriage, right? And then we got di got divorced about a year and a half late. The divorce was okay. about a year so and a half like, late. I mean, how long did that happen? How long? So you separated because of this fight? With I didn't you? separate because of that. That was like the, be that was probably, that was in my second year of marriage that that happened to us. Oh, okay. Yes, we, we stayed married for another and we ended up leaving the congregation where he grew up and, and, and all of that. And um, that was part of the problem, because when you marry somebody that's that prominent in the organization and they got that many people in their family, when you come in, you're like an outsider because the sister probably had somebody else in mind for her brother. You know, people do that kind of crazy stuff. They do. It, it's so crazy and cold. Yeah, because I'm going to so tell you what, I'm, I'm just going to deviate just for a second. Okay. When I had moved to Ohio and my mother had told people that I was engaged to a Bethelite or I was dating a Bethelite, whatever, courting. <laughs> and um, when when JT finally came to uh, meet me or visit our family in Ohio, the friends in the congregation was saying that would be he would make a nice husband for sister so and so. You know, right. you are. So like, how can you be? How can he come here and visit me? And you take my man and give him to somebody else. You know, that was crazy. I was like, this is so crazy. It, it is you know? crazy. And I've heard stories like that before. Um, and you're right. You're absolutely right. It, it just was crazy. Um, that, that, that was one story. There are others. But, you know, when we think about, again, the hidden struggles and the mm -hmm. traumas, um, I I think that, you know, years later, you have a memory you might forget about or it takes you somewhere emotionally that you thought you had managed and had under control. And so I think it's important for your viewers and listeners to understand that this is just going to be with you. You you can you can overcome it and you can heal. But 
it, it stays with you, you know, and, and life continues to happen. So we were married. Um, like I said, we stayed married for almost 10 years. I initiated the divorce because I just wasn't in love with him. And I remember the moment that I had that I had, a, I, have, I have a lot of what I call pivots and light bulb moments in life. And I had gone on this, this girl's trip with a bunch of witness women. We had traveled. My mother came with me, um, a cousin by marriage. My sister didn't come because she was planning her wedding. And we traveled to New York to see the color purple on Broadway and do dinner and do a little shopping. And it was on that trip. You know, I hung out a little bit. We deviated from the group and went clubbing a little bit and different things like that. And it was on that trip. I remember um, my mom had left to go do some shopping, quick shopping before it was time for us to go back. And I sat in that hotel room and I opened up my window and I looked out the window of our hotel and I told myself, I said, I'm not going to stay married. I knew it. And I was not connected to him. We, we weren't connected at all in any way. And I just knew that, that, that I wasn't going to stay married. I didn't know how, I didn't know what. And when we came back, I just moved differently. We started driving separately to the Kingdom Hall, <laughs> you know, all the things. And then I remember telling him, you know what, we, we're going to have to do something here because, you know, we're not, we're not connected. Nothing's happening. What are we doing here? I said, you know, I, I thought about going to get some therapy. Well, back then, therapy was still had a stigma attached to it. Kind of taboo, right? Right. And what did I say that for? Let me tell you what. This is funny. You'll laugh at this. Um I said, you know, I, I feel like um, we, we, we need to talk to the brothers. I, you Don't you go talking to the brothers. Da, 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 da. So he thought that I had went and talked to the, the one of the elders. I, I didn't. And so for a whole week, he didn't talk to me. He didn't say anything. So finally, when I did go talk to the elders, we're sitting there and it's me, the only woman, him in this room with all these men. And I'm talking and this, that, and the other. And he's talking and he says, well, you know, she's, she's, she's got mental issues. She says she's going to see a therapist. So I was like, oh, he wants me to make me out to be crazy. Okay, I got you. So I let him talk and I said, well, it's really interesting that he would say that, but we haven't been intimate in well over two years. Yeah. And when I said that, those brothers turned around and looked at him and it changed the whole, you know, trajectory of the conversation. But he, he did not expect me to do that. But I, you know, I'm like, okay, hold on. There's no way you're going to frame me as some crazy emotional sister like the brothers like to do. Right. And they looked at him. They were like, what is going on? are you, what, what is going on? You know? And so it went different. So I remember when we left that meeting, he literally said to me, well, that didn't go how I thought it was going to go. Girl, I got in my car and went on about my business and it just went from there. You know, it, we, we never recovered from that. And I finally filed and um, I was crazy enough to think that we could be separated in the home until everybody could land on their feet. Right. But that didn't work. He, acted crazy and I ended up having to leave and my brothers threatened to kill him. You know, that kind of thing. Right. You know. Oh my God, I made um, a laugh about it. Oh, it's funny. We <laughs> laugh. We, we kill my brothers laugh about it. So long story short, you know, I'm happily divorced. I, I, I recovered from that and I had a jewelry business. I used to sell, you know, um, costume jewelry, really nice jewelry. I would travel to um, New York to the garment district to get pieces. I had my wholesale license and I would do shows and I would travel out to California to the fashion district in LA. And when I spent some time in both coasts, I kept thinking I could do, New I didn't care for LA like that, but I was like, I could, I could do New York. So I started looking for a job and decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to move to New York. And that is what I did. And of course I hustled and I was on my grind. I, I, I you know, I worked, I worked for um, a couple of, of high net worth individuals. I ended up being the second assistant to the only billionaire that I've ever known. You know, and like most witness women who have 
quote unquote, decent jobs were always somebody's assistant and some type of administrative role because, you know, you don't go to college. I'd, I'd had my associate's degree um, as a paralegal. And so I utilized that and it just went from there, you know, and I was still going to the hall. And I remember I was in Brooklyn at the assembly and I was sitting there and they were interviewing someone on stage and I was sitting in that assembly. And I said to myself, this is my last time coming here. I will not be back. This is, I don't, I don't like this. I'm not enjoying this. And I knew how to fade away without really understanding that that's what I was doing. So like when I would call my parents back home in Michigan, you know, oh, I'm just taking a break. I haven't been to the meeting in three months. Oh my God, what's going on? I just need a break. I just need a break. And that's how I did it. And eventually that turned into other things. And I remember one interesting point. I was at the grocery store with my brother and we ran into this woman who went to all the meetings and she wasn't baptized and she never commented. And I always thought that was so weird. And so I told my brother, I said, you know, this lady, she comes to all the meetings and she never comments. And they told her they've studied every book with her. And since she's not getting baptized, she, you know, don't comment and all of this. And I was like, that's crazy. And he looked at me, my brother did. And he said, you know what, Daria, maybe that works for her. So that's where my critical thinking started coming in. And I was like, you know what? If that is working for her, who am I? It's none of my business. And I started to think like that. And that's when the shift came where you don't have to do everything that, you know, and, and so it was just gradual, right? And so that's the other thing that I notice in the XJW community. I see so many, particularly young people and people who are coming up out of this and they're so hurt. And they're so angry and they feel so deceived and used. And I understand all of that. Mm -hmm. But you need to give yourself time. You know, you can overcome. And I think it is important to remember that some of this will just be. And you have to get to a point where you can manage your expectations. But you need to give yourself time when you're waking up. You have to learn who you are. Decide who you want to be. Decide what you believe, how you want to believe, and that takes time. And you get so many people who come out of this and they they dive in head first and they don't know who they are. They're very angry. They're confused and they, they don't get any professional help. And they, they end up gravitating to these what I call dark spaces in the community. And that didn't work for me. You know, when I was uh, waking up and I started looking at groups on Facebook, if you will, I saw all this dark, you know, negative and all the complaints and all the bitterness. And that did not work for me. I knew I was done, but I wanted to connect with people that were like me. And so your channel, um, Critical Thinkers, it was like a breath of fresh air. And I, you know, when I would watch the channel and I watch you and JT, I felt like I knew you guys. I felt like, oh, well, if I met them, these are people I would have been friends with, right? And so it was so, so helpful, you know? And I think, um, I don't know how that happened. I think I sent you a note and then I did a message. I messaged you directly and I said, I sent you a note. And you you said, we get so many and you looked for it. And then I think you say, girl, you're from Michigan. I have to call you, you know? <laughs> and so it kind of went from there, but you need to understand how impactful and how powerful what you and JT are doing. And I think yeah. that's something else that people need to be mindful. If you're not careful, you'll end up exhibiting the same beha cultish behaviors and doing some of the same things that you did when you were in it. You have to find places that are helpful and supportive and positive that, that are present and allow you to grieve what mm -hmm. one was, but then you have to be honest with yourself and you got to want to heal and you have to overcome. And I was fortunate to have a network of family and friends right already that, that could, could support me in that. But I was very, very intentional about wanting to overcome. And so by the time I'd been in New York for almost 10 years and I found my lump in my uh, left breast and I went to get it checked out. And I just thought it was going to be a cyst or something like that. I never expected them to tell me that I had cancer. Mm -hmm. 
So when I got that diagnosis, I had to reassess some things and decide how I wanted to do it. I had a really wonderful network of friends. My best friend is in New York. My brother is there, who is my best friend as well. You know, we were tight. Um, and my all my friends, they were like, you do not have to go back to New York. We will help support you through this. But I knew, and my parents, when I called and told them, they were like, we'll come to New York. We'll do whatever you want. And I knew a part of that was them wanting to be there for me despite the nuances and the dynamics of the religion. Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. And I knew that um, they couldn't sustain going back and forth. I didn't want my parents doing that. And so I did my research and found a good hospital and cancer center in Michigan. And I made the choice to come back. And I remember my brother, he was he was upset with me at first. He was like, you, you don't have to do this. And I said, come on, you know, I, I need to do this. And so I did it. And I'm glad I did it because I know now that I came back to Michigan for more than just cancer. It allowed me to really get to know my parents all over again and see some things through a different lens. And it allowed them to get to know me and see me differently. And it, it also allowed me to continue to foster those relationships with um, non-witness family that was so important to me. And it, I think in some ways it brought all of us together because mm -hmm. my cancer experience, I was, I had an aggressive form of cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And it is very common in black and brown women and in young women. And nobody knows why. I didn't have a family history, if you will. I wasn't a smoker. I wasn't a drinker. Living in New York, I sold my car years ago. I walked everywhere. <laughs> you know, I had <laughs> trainers. I'd go to the park. So I was healthy. So I was completely shocked that I had this diagnosis and this happened. And again, my personality is such that it's like, okay, what do I need to do? Let's do this. And so I got my set first opinion in New York, moved back to Michigan, got my second opinion there. And I spent all of 2019 in treatment. I had two surgeries. Um, I had a really bad infection. I did um, almost, I did 15 rounds of chemo. I was supposed to do 16, but my body could only take 15. I did 30 rounds of radiation. Um, uh, I was sick. I lost every hair on my body. Everybody's always amazed at my hair, but I lost every hair on my body. And in March of next year, I will be cancer free for five years. So well, congratulations. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Yes, I'm really thankful. Um, I've, I've, I've been very intentional. While I was in treatment, I decided that I was going to go back to school and finally finish my degree. I had no idea that COVID was going to happen and we would be in a global pandemic and shut down the following year. I thought that I would get through 2019, finish treatment and move back to New York City. That was my plan. Oh, my goodness. And you know what? That is so true because you did all that pre-COVID. I did all of it pre-COVID. Oh, so the timing was was better than, I mean, can you imagine going through all that in New York and not knowing that COVID was doing all that, you know, you know it would have been all people in New York. And that's, and that's why I know that coming back to Michigan was divine. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer. I believe that that is what God wanted for me. And I believe that I was supposed to, and so many other things have happened since I came back that have affirmed that for me. And so one of them was when I was in treatment, I said I was going back to school. I'm going to get my degree. And um, I, I did. I signed up and got myself enrolled. I started school in 2020. And just this past May, I graduated magna cum laude, laude with my degree uh, my bachelor of science degree in international relations. And I started, Congratulations. thank you so much. And I started working on, um, can we do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, that was, that was always something that lingered. That was another something that I never, ever agreed with the whole stance on education, which Everything that's happening now, what we're seeing is just unbelievable and so triggering for me because mm -hmm. I think that education is so important. And so 
to see them doing it again, right? To see it out there like that. They're really, you know, demonizing people and chastising people for wanting to educate themselves and better themselves. It's just such a travesty and a shame, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, but I, I did that. And, you know, I also started to... LLCs. I have an event design business that I started with one of my aunts. We do events. We don't coordinate. We just do the decor and the design. Um, we do corporate events, birthday parties, weddings, showers, you name it, celebrations. We do it all. Um, and we we really hone in on our craft. We like to give people top-notch quality premium looks. And we try to work within all budgets and, and really make it beautiful and unique. Um, and then be when I was in treatment, I really didn't know anything about can breast cancer, cancer really, before I got sick. But when I was in treatment, I started reading up on it. And when I saw that my particular subtype was common in black and brown women and young women, I wanted to know why. And so when I started reading about the inequities and the disparities and started realizing the racism in medicine and in health and, and, and how Black people were not being treated fairly and we also weren't as proactive about our health because of the history of racism and things like that in medicine, it just lit a fire under me. So I started advocacy. And that has led to so many wonderful, wonderful opportunities for me. Um, I'm involved with a couple of, of nonprofits that focus on cancer and survivorship. Um, I was able to this summer advocate on Capitol Hill for a survivorship care plan policy um, with with others who all we all visited our representatives and our senators offices on Capitol Hill, you know, and being a part of all of that. It's so interesting because as a Jehovah's Witness, who could do something like that? True. And the importance, and the importance of it. We were advocating for survivorship care uh, policy and plans to help people in survivorship because even after cancer is over, there's so much that happens to you on the back end that you don't even realize after treatment, right? The side effects and all the things and and the the financial toxicity and the weight of cancer. I've been fortunate to have a support system and some resources, but most people do not, Lady C. So mm -hmm. all of that as a result of cancer. And I'm working on my master's in public health. I never could have dreamed or imagined any of this. Yet here I am. And so I think um, really focusing on overcoming. And to the young people, I really think it's important that you find people that are going to upbuild and encourage you. And sometimes when you have been in an oppressed environment and in such a strict environment, you gravitate to whatever is going to let you just do whatever. And I understand that, but that is not healthy and it is not safe. You need to be with people that are going to uplift and encourage you to be the best version of yourself. And that is the way that you overcome this awful organization. There is no other way. I, I'm a firm believer in that. There is no other way. The best way that I can overcome all the time that I wasted, and I'm a middle-aged woman. The best well, you know, too, but you know what too, Daria, is it sounds like you're not just reacting to you know your situation. In a way, you're reacting because you're 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 getting involved. Yes. But you're not reacting and 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 acting out like, oh my God, I can't believe I this this happened to me. So you're reacting negatively. But what I'm seeing and hearing you say is your reaction is more positive. So with the Jehovah's Witnesses, with your, your cancer diagnosis, your your reaction is to help. Yes. You're on Capitol Hill. You're looking to help people. Yes. You're, you're now getting a, a master's in public health because you realize that there's another way that you could be used to do something for people who might not have the strength or the, or the, you know, like the resources or the Absolutely. mindset that you would have to bring all that together. Absolutely. Know? Abs. Thank you for that. And that is so true. You know, a lot of people are, don't really understand their health and they're uneducated about how to approach their health, let alone a cancer diagnosis. And what I find really interesting is I've helped some Jehovah's witnesses and I'm happy to do it. 
you know, my mother has referred me to some people who didn't know how to navigate the process. And they called me and, you know, let me direct you to this doctor. Here's some questions that you should ask. When you go to these appointments with your mother, make sure that you're recording these appointments with your smartphone so you can go home and listen because it is overwhelming and you are emotional and you are afraid and all of those things are normal. And they've all thanked me and I'll do it again and again and again. I I believe that that is my calling and I believe that my diagnosis is more than me. And so mm -hmm. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and I have family that and friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses and I'm in close relationship with them as close as I can be considering the JW boundaries, right? <laughs> right. I love them. And so I try hard not to offend them, but I am also someone who lives proudly and boldly my truth, right? Um, and I don't censor that. I don't, I'm not in their face. I'm not combative. I'm not dogging their religion, you know, their beliefs. I, I, there's no point in that. And I want people to feel comfortable but I also want them to respect me. So I'm very open about my choices and, and how I live my life. And I think that that is the best way that you can make an impact. And for young people in particular who are trapped and feel afraid, be smart, give yourself a plan and lean into people that can uplift and encourage you. Mm -hmm. As badly as you might want to get buck wild, you know, live your life, do your thing, but but have balance because so much of what being a Jehovah's Witness about is not about balance. So it's easy to tip the scales the other way. That's I, right. Yeah. I tell people that all the time because it's like, you know, you don't been in this religion. You have been, you know, like held back and and you can't do things that you want that you wanted to do. And now you leave and you purposely hurt yourself where mm -hmm. you because, you know, like this one, this one, this one man I was talking to was one of, it was a person I was calling to get some information about a business, mm -hmm. some resources I was trying to buy. And we ended up on the conversation of atheism. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, you're not going to find a um, atheist in prison. Now, mind you, we, I don't know how we ended up on this. We were talking about something. Mm -hmm. And he said, because Atheists believe this is the only life we have, and so they don't want to spend it in jail. <laughs> that's, I'm just making a point. And so his, and so his attitude now, that was the way he was breaking it down. Was but then I hear people who are atheists in the ex Jehovah's Witness community, and they ain't saying that because if this is if you believe this is the only life you have, then you should you know take care of it, right? Exactly, and I think. You know, I Right. And listen, if someone wants to be an atheist, that's their choice. I'm not going to try to change their minds. I can only live my life and let my life reflect the type of mm -hmm. system that I have. And one of the things that I want to say about it is I had to reint reintroduce myself to the Bible. And so I have I still have a lot of unanswered questions, but I'm comfortable being in that space of not having all the answers. I'm okay with that. And mm -hmm. I think that, that is a position that you need to be okay with. And I think that for a lot of people, younger people in particular, who are coming out of that and, oh, I'm an atheist. I think if they allow themselves to grow and mature and just learn a little bit about life, those perspectives can change. You know, it's like I told my dad one time when we did have a, a transparent conversation about who I am now. And I told him I changed my mind. And I said, I, and he he goes, you were 19 when you got baptized. And I said, well, dad, that's true. But haven't you changed your mind some, about some things since you were 19? And so what could he say? And so I think that Allow yourself time to learn who you are. Allow yourself time to heal. Allow yourself time to get some good professional help. You may see a therapist and it might not work. Get another one. If oh, you absolutely. Have, I believe you don't that. Have the, yeah. And if you don't have the I resources that, for it, there's stuff online. Yeah. Um, you know, you just have to be 
mindful. And I think that that is where it starts. I really yeah. do. It takes time, Kathy, to, to come out of this and to heal from it. And like I said, it's been since 2011 for me and I'm still having breakthroughs and I'm okay with that. But one thing I am, you have to learn who you are and be resolved and be resolute in that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, here's what I think. I feel like, like before, when you were talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, I always felt like, this might be the conversation we had before we started the mm -hmm. this podcast, but I feel like um, Jehovah's Witnesses always, because of the way we were reared in this religion, mm -hmm. we have to have some answers. Right. And people just don't want to just allow themselves to not know something. Yes. You know, and so if you don't know it, it doesn't exist. You know, if you, if you can't prove it, I can't, I can't go over, you know, whatever, however they want to look at it. I don't get involved right. in telling people how to worship and what to believe in. Right. Um, that's not my job. I mean, when we were Jehovah's Witnesses, we were always somewhere talking about somebody going to be destroyed at Armageddon. <laughs> well, now that I've left, you know, I don't get into that. It's not my place. That's how right. I feel. And, and I think that that is a really important point because I see a lot of people that I grew up with who have left or they're not active, but I feel like they're still in the mentality. And it seems like many of them still don't know who they are or what they believe. And it, it's like, it's almost like they're in what I call um, a holding pattern. It is. Right? And, I believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, and, and they're also, this is the other part. It takes courage to walk away from this. It takes courage to walk away. It takes courage to be scrutinized, to be judged. Um, I think you have to take your time, like I said, and figure out who you are. Um, and you have to be okay being judged. And you also have to be honest with yourself about what you were a part of. It's hard and it's jarring for a lot of people to hear it was a cult. So that's why sometimes we say high control group. Um, but it's hard for people to, to process and accept that or to even think about the fact that their parents or their family members are a part of it. Mm -hmm. But that is what it is. And if you come to a level of acceptance about that, First and foremost, you've got to be honest with yourself about that. Then you really can start the healing process, but you have to be honest about it first. And I think that so many people are in these holding patterns because they love their family and they don't want to hurt their feelings and all of that. But their feelings are going to be hurt because you're not going to be a witness anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm past that with my parents. OK, you're mad because I'm not a witness. What's next? All the things that I'm doing. <laughs> All the things that I'm doing, I'm there for you. I will be there for my parents. I will be there for them. But you got to remember that this religion is, 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 this is not just a religion. The right. Jehovah's Witnesses is a way of life. Yes. So when you look at the sun rising and setting and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> this is what we're in. This is what we're in. I mean, yeah. if the sun doesn't come up, we're not going to be on this planet because we're not going to be getting any heat. And the way the witnesses look at it is if you ain't at the kingdom hall, you ain't going to be in this world either because you're going to be destroyed. So they, they really believe in this stuff. Yes. And people, when they leave the religion, they still kind of in the back of their mind think, what am I going to do? They're right. What if they're, what if this is the truth? Because when you think about it, they preach stuff that sounds so true and seems so real that even when we first left and after reading Ray Franz Crisis of Conscience, mm -hmm. I remember saying in the back of my mind, I hope I made the right decision. And this is like, this is probably like maybe five or six years after I had left. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And that's why I keep saying it takes time. You have to give yourself time. I completely agree with that. You have to give yourself time. Because, mm -hmm. because I remember you, what you're saying is so true. Because I remember when I first left, I told um, one of my friends, I said, well, if I ever had a kid, now I'm past that now. I'm not having any children. I'm okay. But I 
said, if I ever had a kid, I probably would take them just to give them a little bit of a foundation. Now, that was when I first left. Now, absolutely not. Like, that is the worst thing ever. And I know that. And I'm clear on it. And I don't have any hesitation about saying it. And I don't have any hesitation about saying that I was misinformed back in 2011 when I said that. Mm -hmm. And it took me time to gradually come to that realization. And that is why I say you must give yourself time because your, your thoughts, your position, how you feel, your experiences are going to shape how you think about things as, as you continue to grow away from that. But mm -hmm. in that process, get help, find upbuilding, uplifting, supportive environments where you can heal and, and find peace and find some, some, some happiness, find your joy. But the only way you do that is you first have to be honest with yourself about what you were a part of. Right. I think I, I highly recommend getting a new clientele of friends. And I also, based on my own personal experience, leaving this religion, I do not recommend trying to connect with witnesses that are currently at the Kingdom Hall and hoping they'll wake up. Don't even try that. Because the more you try to hook up with witnesses and be you know, all up in these groups that you're trying to leave, the worse it is for you to get on with your life. Because a lot of times you're thinking, well, I just want somebody to be with me that knows my background and can understand me. Now, Daria, I told you before we started this podcast that one of our book club members yes. has gone back to the Kingdom Hall. And because we used to have a book club, for those of you who don't know, we used to have a, um, a book club every month. And one of our book club members left and went back to the Kingdom Hall and she has since um, unfriended us on Facebook and blocked us. How so, did you realize that she went back? Um, Somebody told me. Okay. Well, a friend, a, another good friend of mine told me. It's, about it's, it. it's a shame, but mm -hmm. I, I also want to say this too. Um, people stay in for different reasons that have nothing to do with scripture mm -hmm. or, or doctrine, if you will. And so who knows what the story is behind that, right? But it's unfortunate because she didn't allow herself the opportunity to, to step out there and 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 you you have to be willing to, as you say, to let other people in. Mm -hmm. I remember um, my best friend, we've been best friends for 10 years now. And I remember I was so guarded because I had been burned by people. Um, and my brother, he said, let her in, let her in. Now, again, I had, I had my brothers, I had family, I had aunts, you know, but I let her in and it's the best thing I could have ever done. And yes, you may have some situations where people would, that aren't pleasant and people may hurt you or whatever, but you got to put yourself out there. And again, that's why I said it takes courage, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it again, it takes time. It takes Yeah. Time. And you got to be selective because if you're going to let somebody in, you got to let the right people in because I'd let somebody in mm -hmm. and I bought that person to my job and I almost lost my job. And um, I was like, oh, my God, it was just terrible. Yeah, you have and to be selective. I, you have to be so selective. And so for me, you know, you can love people from a distance, you know. I completely agree and, with that. And I totally believe in that new clientele friends. <laughs> I do too. And and when you're doing that, be selective and 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 you know, take your time with it. You don't have mm -hmm. to release and unload everything and tell all of your business and all of that. Get to know a person, be discerning, pay attention, you know, and it'll it'll work out. It will mm -hmm. work out. And and I'm a living witness to that. No pun yeah. intended. But I, I speak from experience and I've had some, some serious struggles, some serious struggles, health crisis, bad health crisis and divorce and job loss and everything else. I've been through all of that and I've had people hurt me. You know, I've had, I've, I've had some relationships that 
really went sour and people that devastated me. And so I, it, it's not that I haven't experienced any of these things, right? But again, I don't want to sit in a place of pain and anger. And that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad. And, and I can hear that you're not. Yes. You know, because so you're important. taking charge of your life and you're doing things because a lot of people, they would have gave up with the cancer diagnosis. Yeah, no. Um, it's interesting because a lot of times you go through these things. I know for me, and I'm not even thinking like I'm going to do it like this because I got to overcome. I'm just thinking solution. All right. What's next? I sat there. I got the diagnosis. I started researching this, you know, and okay, what are my options? And then I started understanding how important it was to have agency in that process and, and take charge of your health. And I realized that by me taking charge and knowing what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do when I was presented with options, it elevated my standard of care. The doctors and all of the professionals, when they were talking to me and they knew that I was sure about what I wanted to do, that elevated their level of care. If I'd come in there a basket case and uncertain, I would have had people making decisions for me that maybe down the road, I would have made another decision. And I got one more thing I want to share. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to, you I do because I know what you're saying, because when I would go to the doctor and I would start telling them what kind of blood tests I wanted to get, a CBC, this and that. And so the, the one late, the one nurse, she said, oh, she says, oh, are you a nurse? You know, I'm like, no. <laughs> exactly. When you I are in a they language, you know, they yeah. like that. And when you are, and if they don't like it, then they're not a good um, clinician and you need to change your doctor because a good doctor will appreciate and like an informed patient. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they have a problem with it or if they're too arrogant or they don't like you taking agency and, you know, you, th their job is to give you the information and then you decide what works best for you. If they don't like that, then that's not the doctor for you. Get another. Mm -hmm. But one other story in the hidden struggles that I thought about when I was in treatment and it was time for a surgery, you know, and I had, I think I had five surgeries total. I don't even remember. Every single time I would be meeting for pre-op and I'd be sitting there and they asked that question, if something happens and you want a blood transfusion, every single time my mom or my dad or both of them, they weren't in the room. And I thought it was so interesting. And I would say to them, listen, my parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. I am not. They have come with me to every doctor's appointment. And I am so thankful for that. I know that support is unmatched and I don't take it for granted, but let's have this conversation before they come in here because mm -hmm. they're going to be uncomfortable. They're, I don't want them to be upset. I'm I, not only am I managing my emotions around this, this awful disease, I'm managing theirs too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ross, no problem putting those notes down, but that is an experience that I had in the cancer journey, if you will, that a lot of people don't have to deal with. So again, that's another hidden struggle that you, that you have as a result of being a part of an organization like this and having loved ones that are in it. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to, you know, curate how the conversations go, if you will. But I, I did have to do that. And it, it, it always was fascinating to me that this would happen. I'm glad that you handled it that way because I've heard people say, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. And then they would go and have that clash. Um, I don't have nothing to hide from nobody. So I'm going to let my parents know I'm going to get this blood transfusion. But the way you handled it was better for everyone involved. It kept people from having to be, you know, having these issues or, you know, like arguing clashes and stuff, you know, yeah, like, right. so now you got your parents here, not wanting to be here now because you're some person that's sinning and all that kind of stuff so now you exactly. kind of like lessened the uh, the issues and and the stress absolutely and also to that point not only did I do that but I had it in writing I had my durable power of attorney written <laughs> out and I had copies given to family members that in the case of something happening listen you all know this is what's going to happen and you know how my parents are going to respond and I want to manage it and I don't want them to feel compromised in their faith. So this is why I'm doing it like that. So I had all of my I's dotted and my T's crossed, if you will, 
Mm-hmm. But the reality is that the average person who is not a Jehovah's Witness wouldn't even have to give something like that thought. So it's just another one of those those hidden struggles or those nuances that a lot of us are faced with. Yeah. Well, Daria, I am so excited that you were able to come on the platform and tell your story. This is such a great conversation yes. and just something that people can just listen to, to, you know, just hear what you've been through because, you know, sometimes because you're a Jehovah's Witness, you feel that you're in the wrong making these decisions. And, mm-hmm. you know, even from just the fact of just leaving your spouse, because, a lot of people might not have been able to navigate that or right. make the decision to leave or even like you picked up and moved to another city and, and dealt with a um, life-threatening illness and stuff like that and still bouncing back, you know? Still, well, and, and now you're here hanging out with Congress. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> well, you know, um, Lady C, first of all, thank you so much for that. And thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, I do not take all the credit. I believe that it is divine. I believe that God has really guided my steps and, and, and been there for me and gotten me through. And I don't, I don't hold back from saying that. Um, but I hold space for everyone and I, you know, I remain open and, and listen to everyone and I meet people where they're at. Right. And so I don't want the message to be missed that even if, you know, oh, she's a believer, don't dismiss what I'm saying. Learn who you are to give yourself time to heal from this and give yourself time to figure out who you want to be in the world. How do you want to show up and what you want to do with your life? And I also want to say at age 52, it is never, ever too late. I went back and I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that it is never too late. A lot of us have been so devastated by the time wasted and and the the missed opportunities and the lost dreams and and not tapping into our giftings and our talents and the things that we were blessed with naturally. But it is never too late to tap into that. And I think it's really important for people to hear that you have to give it time and you have to have a plan and you have to stay focused. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's important that when you are out here searching and trying to land on your feet and figure out your community, you find spaces in the community that are positive and upbuilding and focus on healing and overcoming. That is so important. And so I want to, really, I want to I wanna make sure that, you know, I, 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 I promote that because it's important. It is. And I think that, you know, if people, my, one of my other things I'd like to say before closing is I really feel like people need to um, stop being that victim yes. and wake up and take charge of their lives because you can leave the religion and you will find yourself spending just as much time on the outside leaving and being angry and being upset about your life as a witness that now you're going to waste the rest of your life looking back over that experience. Exactly. And I can't say this enough that you've already been traumatized enough. Yes. You know, so I'm my, my recommendation is you got to stop looking behind and look forward. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So anyway... I want to thank you so much, Daria, for being a guest on my podcast. And I'm looking forward to you participating in future uh, live streams and, um, you know, group discussions, because we got some other discussions we're going to be talking about later on. But this has been Lady C. And I thank you all for being in my audience. And I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, Lady C. Bye bye, everybody. (laughs) This program was sponsored by Critical Thinkers.